and officially welcome everyone to tonight's presentation, Developing a Cascading Curriculum with Garfield Ginny Newman. And we want to thank everyone for being here. We know that uh, things can be up in the air a little bit for for uh, all of you right now. And so we appreciate you taking the time to further your PD. And uh, any self-directed learning is totally up to you, regardless of, uh, of what affiliate you belong to right now. So we do appreciate you uh, being here tonight. And uh, we are also very grateful for Garfield and his time. And, uh, and you will certainly enjoy and, uh, and really uh, get a lot out of tonight's presentation. Um, on behalf of Syria Skurhan, who is the administrator and facilitator of the OTF Connects program, uh, she especially extends a thank you to you all for your participation tonight and for sharing the information about OTF Connects with your colleagues and encouraging them to access our archived recordings as well as join the live sessions. Uh, it really is for you guys and by you guys, so thank you very much. Now what I have up here is our map of Ontario and this is where we're going to use those two tools. Uh, I'd like you to start with the clip art tool. And hi, Gloria, thanks. Um, so you'll find that tool is the very bottom one in your tool strip. You click on that, and you're going to get a pop-up box that says clip art. And I'd ask you to select the common symbols tab, and then choose one of those icons, and then place it on the map approximately in the area that you are joining us from tonight. And for those of you that want to go ahead and try the text tool, you can select the capital letter A and drop that on the screen and type in the name of the town or city that you're in. I'm going to change the size of my word there. Fantastic. Look how spread out across Ontario we are today. And who is it that we've got way over there by the Manitoba border? You can just let us know in the chat. Unless someone accidentally dropped the exclamation point there. I'm thinking it is you, Marietta. I can see you typing. And if I recall, we had some uh, time. Uh, uh, time difference issues at times. So I have to remind myself to let everyone know that our sessions are scheduled for Eastern time. Anyway, thank you very much. What I'm going to do now is just turn it over to Garfield, who I believe will be uh, sharing his uh, application in the whiteboard space tonight for uh, a part of the evening. And, uh, and if you have any questions or technical issues, just let me know in the chat and I will follow up with you. Great. Thanks so much, Louise. And good evening, everyone. Uh, actually, what I want to do to start off, if we could, Louise, is just do a little polling. And uh, if you could help me set that up. And we just, I just want to get a sense of uh, your familiarity. The, the Building the Cascading Curriculum we're going to talk about is, is launching from the uh, Critical Thinking Consortium's work around uh, inquiry and critical thinking. So what I wanted to just uh, see how familiar people are with that work. And some of you, I think, have attended uh, lots of sessions and have great familiarity. Uh, others, perhaps not. So I was going to do a, a four-point uh, scale here, if we could, um, Louise, with uh, A or 1, whichever you want to set up, being very familiar. So if you are very familiar, you, you've attended several sessions and, and maybe have used the work for a while. Um, B being somewhat familiar, maybe attended a, a session or uh, an online piece in the past, and a bit about the critical thinking work that we do. Um, aware of uh, will be our third. Uh, perhaps you've heard from someone else, or you have some awareness, but not really a lot of experience yourself. And and the fourth one, uh, unaware. Don't really know what crit the critical thinking consortium is. Uh, I'm not really sure of the work you do. So we're going to ask you just to, um, and, and Louise will give you direction, just to uh, vote on one of those that best describes your familiarity with the work that we do from the critical thinking consortium. Okay, I see most of you have uh, gone up to your polling tool, which is underneath your name, and it, you'll see it as a little letter A right now. So I think we just have a couple of people that haven't been able to uh, select it yet. So let me know if you're having issues or perhaps you're not currently at your computer. So Gloria, it's just you. <laughs> Sorry to single you out. <laughs> All right, I see you're typing a message there. If you have trouble with the tool, you can go ahead and just let us know your response in the chat. Sorry, uh, Gloria, the question I just want to respond to from the ABCD 
uh, how familiar are, with, are you with the work of the Critical Thinking Consortium and the work that we do at Embedding Critical Thinking and Teaching? So A, very familiar, attended uh, presentations and have used the work. B, perhaps have been to a single presentation, a bit about the work. C, have heard about the work. Uh, D, I'm familiar. I see you already voted before I finish going through, which is great. Thanks so much. Okay, so um, that's very helpful uh, for me. Um, it, it lets me know, uh, because I put it at the beginning of the session a little bit around the critical thinking. So those of you, um, the four of you who said B, um, we will uh, just do a little bit of review and not, not spend too much time, but just to create a, a context, because when we dig into the cascading idea, we want to frame it around invitations to, to think critically and, and to innovate. Um, so what we're going to do is, is I'm going to share my application. And um, let me just set that up. And I'll get this going in one second. So let me know if you can see. What you should see now um, is uh, it should say designing for sustained inquiry. So can I just uh, get a a happy face to show that that uh, you can see this. Everyone's got the same thing on their screen. Perfect. Thank you so much. So welcome, Carol. Now I had asked earlier, and um, and many people gave me a sense just what grade you teach and what subjects, just to try to get a, a range of of who we have here tonight. And just uh, for everyone else's benefit, it would appear that we have a a, a great range of teachers from uh, everything from kindergarten. Um, to grade 12, so we've got the full range and I think a range of subjects represented. So it'll be an interesting conversation. Here's the the structure that I'm hoping that we go through for the evening. Um, I want to start maybe the first half hour just uh, laying that foundation for approaching learning through a critical thinking lens and, and then introduce a way of planning the curriculum for what I call sustained inquiry, which I'll explain as we get into this. And then have some time for us to put our heads together and start doing this. This is why, and this question came up earlier, and I may just pause to in case there are questions on this. Uh, Louise had sent out earlier today uh, an email with an attachment I asked her to send. It's just a blank template that we're going to play a bit with tonight. And I thought it might be helpful if you had a, a hard copy you print off sitting beside you. Uh, that you might want to muck about on, write on as we talk. So has everyone been able to open that email and, and receive that uh, attachment? Just pause and, and uh, if you didn't receive that attachment, can you just um, let us know in the chat window? I just quickly changed back to the yes or no poll. So if that's easier, you can give us a green check mark if you've got the okay, file. Okay, that's great. Okay, so uh, great. So I'm going to let uh, Louise follow the the um, response to that, and she will uh, get it out to those of you who have not received it. Uh, now we don't need it right away, so we'll we'll see if we can get that to you before we get to that piece of the evening. So I'm just going to uh, slide over my screen a little bit here. So as I said, I wanted to start the evening just a little bit around the critical thinking piece, just, just to give us that foundation. And, and when we talk about thinking critically, a couple of key things that, that guide us. So when we begin framing our questions tonight, this is what I'm going to ask you to think about in terms of how we frame our questions for students in building our inquiry unit. Uh, first of all, for someone to be thinking critically, uh, they have to be attempting to assess or judge something. So critical thinking, uh, means to assess or judge the merits in light of some, of some relevant criteria. So I want you to know we're, we're, students will often confuse critical thinking with uh, criticizing. So, so what you'll get is that students think if we ask them to critically analyze or critically assess, that that means to point out the shortcomings or flaws in something. Uh, and that's an, a misunderstanding and it leads to some confusion. And it's interesting to me because often the word, you know, we attach the word critical to so many things. We'll just say, well, uh, we're going to do a, a critical review or critical analysis. But I'm not sure often it's clear what we actually mean by that. And students often aren't really sure. 
uh, what that means. So just to try to bring some clarity, um, critical thinking comes from the Greek word meaning criteria. And all critical thinking is, is making a judgment or an assessment in light of some clear criteria. So what we want to get kids doing, uh, note to move them from thinking if I like something it's good and if I don't like it it's bad, to establishing criteria that allows them to assess something thoughtfully. And, and uh, an example I'll often use you know, is a movie or a song and point out that um, I might dislike a song but recognize the brilliance in it. I, I might not be a fan of a particular type of art. Uh, for example, uh, Roko Co art is not really my favorite, uh, Baroque art is not my favorite type, um, and yet I can see the brilliance in the, in the work of art. So, so there's what I like, and then there's brilliance. Uh, there might be a type of music that's not a genre I like, and yet I can recognize the brilliance in it. So what we want uh, to help students do is to think critically about issues from you know, in kindergarten, what makes someone a good friend, uh, what does it mean to act responsibly, um, you know, to high school and civics, what, what's the criteria for effective leadership? How do we judge quality leaders? Um, and so on. So what we want to do is get kids having to think about issues using criteria. And what we're going to talk about tonight in building curriculum for sustained inquiry, you'll note on the right what I'll call in, in quotes uh, traditional approach, we tend to teach answers. Um, and then the student's job is to remember those answers and then we test them on it. In a critical thinking approach that's kind of flipped upside down, uh, we don't teach the answers. It's the student's job to figure out a reasonable answer. But we do have to help them develop the intellectual tools to develop that answer. So while we don't teach for answers that are you know, fixed answers that, that we then test on, what's important to understand is we do have to help students have the, the requisite tools, the background, and so on. And we're going to talk about those. That will allow them to be thoughtful in coming up with an answer. And so this is a very, very quick uh, context for it, but this is the, the framework. When I asked earlier, if you're familiar with the work of TC Squared, this is the framework. And TC Squared stands for the Critical Thinking Consortium. And uh, we've been work OTF has been a partner with Critical Thinking Consortium for four or five years now. And uh, the Critical Thinking Consortium itself actually just uh, celebrated its 20th birthday last week. Uh, so for 20 years, we've been uh, working with school districts, school boards, uh, teacher federations across North America and internationally on finding ways to embed critical thinking in the work that students do. And we're going to talk about each of these pieces a little bit tonight, but the, the three keys as, as we see it is how do we build a community of thinkers? How do we create the classroom climate where thinking is encouraged and supported and expected and modeled? Um, so that, that thinking is, is, is kind of the nature of what happens in our classrooms. And we want to frame the learning around what we call critical challenges. And what we mean by a critical challenge, these are invitations for children to, to um, assess, judge, to create something using, using criteria to guide them. So, and no, we want that to be the driver for learning. So instead of teaching the content and then giving them the task, you're going to see throughout the evening that the encouragement here is to think about what's the challenge and then how do we teach the support to get there to, sol to solve that problem. And I mentioned earlier the need for intellectual tools. So at the bottom you see what we've identified in our research is that there are five intellectual tools that students need to be able to engage in critical thinking. Uh, the first one you see there is background knowledge. That uh, when I said to you we don't teach answers, uh, that's not the same as to say we don't teach any content because certainly we do. That in a critical thinking approach, the content is learned in the service of the problem. The, the, we give them an authentic and meaningful challenge, and we then say, now what content, what background will you need in order to be able to solve that challenge? And then we, we teach the background. Now, we again, we want to think about how do we teach the background in a way that's not merely transmissive, but also engages inquiry. We're going to talk about that as we get uh, later in the evening. But the first piece is, once we've identified the challenge for students, to think about what background do they need to be able to solve that problem. The second one is criteria for judgment. So if we ask students to render a judgment of some kind, to create something of some kind, what criteria will they use to guide them in their thinking and their work? Those are the two pillars of all critical thinking. Uh, students have to have something to think about that they get from either that they bring to the class in their prior learning, that they learn in the class through teacher direction, through independent reading, independent research, through collaborative work with others. 
and they need criteria to guide them in making their decisions and judgments. The third tool we want to think about uh, is the critical thinking vocabulary. Do students understand what they're being asked to do? Do they understand the nature of the language of thinking? So do they understand the term inference? Do they understand uh, what it means to analyze or evaluate? Do they understand the difference between a prediction or a guess? Uh, these are our language pieces that students need in order to be able to engage in critical thinking. Uh, the fourth tool that we work with are thinking strategies. And thinking strategies are ways in which we help students take the background and see connections, uh, organize in a sensible way, connect it to the criteria that allows them to use the evidence to support them in their judgment. And the last are the habits of mind, the habits of good thinkers. And, and, and we work with 19 different habits. Uh, and we would suggest that in any given activity we do with kids, one or two habits would be at play at most. These are things like often you'll see them aligning to character education, for example, uh, paying attention to detail, being open-minded, uh, showing empathy, um, perseverance. Those are the kind of habits that we talk about. Now, let's just pause for a moment in case there are some questions, because I, I'm going to kind of go back and forth a little bit. But let me just bring up the chat. Are there any questions? And again, that's been a quick review for, for many of you who will be familiar already. But are there any questions that, that come up um, for you as we just do a quick introduction to this? Okay, so I'm not I'm not seeing uh, I'm not seeing any typings, which is um, so I think we're good. I'm just going to go back to my slides, and we'll dig in and we'll get some conversation going on moment now. So when we talk about three types of questions, and again I know many of you have seen this before, so we'll keep this fairly tight. Uh, we we talk about three different types of questions. Uh, essentially, there are what we would call a type one question. You can see from the screen here. Uh, that we would see as locating facts. So you'll notice in, in all the, here you have a, kind of the attributes of the types of questions. So type one questions, you tend to be, you know, looking up information. It's retrieval, as you can see. There's often a single right answer. You'll notice there's no decision. There's no decision required in type one. I've simply asked you to find something. So in type one questions, kids might produce a list. From brainstorming, they might recall something the teacher taught the day before. They might Google it to find out. They might look it up in their textbook. But we haven't asked them to weigh it, to, uh, to apply criteria to make a decision. What you notice in column two, we're asking to describe how you feel about something. So there's a personal statement, a preference. Do you like something? How would you feel it? And you'll notice the third level down there, the locus of inquiry, that lies within the individual. Each of us have our own answer. And therefore, there are no wrong answers. And, and so what we would say in type two, there is a, there's a decision to be made. But that decision is often based on a gut feeling. It's, it's within each of us. And as a result, that decision is not necessarily grounded in any criteria or, in, in many cases, even evidence. So if I ask you your favorite flavor of something, um, you may not understand why you like one flavor more than that. You don't cite evidence. It's just how you feel about it. And then you'll, you'll notice that there is a decision in two where there wasn't in one. But when we move to what we call a type three question, these are critical thinking questions where we ask the learner to make an assessment. So I want you to note there, there is a decision being made. But here, instead of the decision being how I feel about it, I have to use evidence and I would apply criteria to help me guide that. Again, there's more than a single answer, but there's not as big a range as in type two. Because here, the students have to be able to support with reasoning, and that reasoning is using criteria and using evidence to support. They would defend their answer. So I'm just going to uh, share a few questions with you and just have a little bit of conversation. So if I ask this, uh, have Aborig Aboriginals affected today's world? These questions come from a project I've been involved in called the Global Teenager Project, where students from around the world have been participating in an online discussion uh, around the issue of uh, United Beyond Our Diversity. And these are some of the questions from different countries that were posted. Would you, and what we're trying to do, by the way, is help them tweak their questions, uh, recognize when they were true inquiry questions. I just said it was column three. Um, and if they weren't, how they would tweak them. So here's what I'm wanting to do. Have Aboriginals affected today's world? Uh, Louise, a quick poll, if you would. Uh, one, two, or three. Just that we just have an A or a B in this. And the, sorry, 
uh, A, B, or C. So is that a one, two, or three would probably be the best to start out. And if I get anyone just to, what would you see that question? Is that a one, two, or a three? So the question was, is this question, have aboriginals affected today, today's world? Is that a one, two, or a three? So is that a look it up? Is it a judgment? Is it a how I feel about it? Now, from what I see in the polling, uh, page browser, OK, sorry. How is that? Sound better? All right. So let me just discuss this for just a moment. Um, now, it's interesting. Uh, I just changed the question, by the way. I want you to know that when I changed it to how have, it changes the nature of the question. Now, people who started to vote, the majority were saying uh, that this is, in fact, sorry, let me just get rid of something for a moment here, that this is, in fact, a type 3 question. When are we at have they? And someone said it was a type 2. Now, if you, th if you think this, this, if students were to see this as how do I feel about it, do I think, that, do I feel like they have, they may read that as a 2. But in fact, have they requires a judgment. And we could, well, we could ask what, what you mean by effect. What criteria would you use? Um, what criteria would you use to, to say affected? Um, so what I want to note is when I put how have, that creates a list. So now students can say, well, they've affected it this way, this way, and this way. Here are three ways. But you didn't ask me for a decision. How have they? A list. Have they requires a judgment. If I took that list question, so that's a type three. Yeah, I can slide over this way to do it. So let me use the, then I cover up the chat. So here's what we're going to do. Just bear with me and I'm going to reset some things so we can get these all together. So I'm just going to tighten some things up. All right, how's that? Okay, so. What I want to just point out is, if we ask students how have Aboriginals affected, we get a list question. If we ask them have they, they have to make a decision. If we took the list they created one and said identify the most significant impact, we would have an inquiry question, a judgment for them to make. Let me just pull out a different question for a second. Oops, sorry about that. All my questions back there. I pull out a different get away from those. How about, how about this question? As the world gets smaller through the use of technology and social media, are we giving up some more culture and adopting other practices? Is that a one, two, or a three? Let's just do one more uh, vote on that. If we could reset the vote. There we go. Okay, good. Oh, okay, sorry. We're going to reset the vote, please. Um, yep, I've cleared it, so it's still an ABC option. Is that all right? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Now let me ask you, just as you're, as you're typing this in, and, and everyone's seeing this as a three, would your students understand this as a three? Um, I mean, I, I, I think I would agree with you. I think there's a decision to be made. Will students clearly see that, or will they see this uh, so Nancy, you said a B, and I'm wondering, through the eyes of a student, would that be seen as a B? Does it, could it appear to students that it's a do you like social media question? Um, 
So what I want to say is what we want to do is be careful that our questions are tighter when we frame them so students clearly understand the judgment they're being asked and how, they're going to, and how we frame that question. Because this one I think is a little, little wordy for kids. Let me just do one more. Last one, if we could just reset one last time. Is this a one, two, or three? In what way is the culture in your country influenced by education, sport, food, and religion? And how does the culture in your country influence education, sport, food, and religion? One, two, or three. Now it's interesting, we have a split here between two and three. Let me ask you a question. Let me just take that first part, we'll isolate the first part. In what ways is the culture in your country influenced by education, sport, food, and religion? Stop there. How would a student go about answering that? What, what decision are they being asked to make? And secondly, could I give you a list? Could I brainstorm? A list. Could I Google that? Could I look it up? Let's just throw some thoughts on that in the chat window. Sorry, I was unclear in, in that. But it, is that a question that requires me to apply criteria to make a judgment? Or will students see that as a question which requires them to generate a list? I'm just waiting. I see a, a few responses coming, so I'm just going to wait for those responses. Sorry, Renee, uh, feelings is a two. Uh, one is I can look it up. Two is how I feel. Three is making a judgment. Uh, interesting response. That that. I, there's a judgment to decide what to put on the list. Now, so note if it's if it's mere brainstorming, it would be a one. I just came up with ten things. If I put a limit, you can only put six things on your list. What are you going to keep? It becomes a three. So that's an interesting distinction. If students have to decide what to keep and what not to keep, they're making a judgment. If they're simply listing it, it's a one. And Jennifer, you're right. It's a very detailed list. And see, okay. Now let me ask you, how might you change that question? Because what I'm seeing from people is a range here from many students will simply give us a list. Uh, that's a pretty complex question, Scott points out. Culture, be you know, what defines culture? And it makes up you know, all these pieces of play. How would you rewrite that question? How could we edit it um, so that it, there's clearly a judgment? So I want to show you an edit that I just want to suggest. If I do something as simple as, is culture in your country influenced by education, sport, food, now I have to make a decision. If I asked a, a, perhaps a better, to what degree, would you, would you argue that culture has been uh, more heavily influenced by one or the other? To what degree have each of these influenced? Lots of ways we would play with that, but in what ways is ask students essentially for a list. Uh, note if I, in, how does, now, by the way, I want you to know my other concern with these questions is not only do they uh, require a list, but they also presume the answer. How does culture in your country influence assumes that they do and doesn't allow the student to draw that decision? Whereas if I simply ask, does culture influence education, sport, food, and religion? Now they have to make a decision. Now, there's a lot of unpacking in those questions to do around what is culture, what criteria do how would we decide, but what I want you to see um, Yeah, Jennifer, let me comment on that in just one moment. Uh, what I want you to see is that we have to be careful when we frame our questions. If students are asked, how does, 
or, and so on, they see that as an identified question. They see that as a question that they have to generate a list. Uh, what we want to do is be careful to frame our question in a way that it requires them to make a decision. Now, the second piece, and what often will be said, and I think it's a very important caution, is culture in your country influenced by education, sport, food, and religion? A student who answers thinks that's a yes or no, that should be a red flag to us as educators that they don't really understand critical thinking. Because if you see that as a yes, no, you're saying there's no judgment required. Where in fact, if you understand critical thinking, you'll say, well, that's a judgment question. And what we need to get our students to understand, as soon as they see there's a judgment involved, what they should immediately say to themselves is, if there's a judgment, I know I need criteria. And I need evidence. So the first thing I have to do is, what do I need criteria for? And what evidence could I gather? What would the evidence look like to support the decision that I made? And so no, what we want to do is get kids accustomed when they see a question, what criteria do I use to help me decide? And how will the evidence help me frame my decision? Now, I don't want to belabor this too long. This is meant just to be a review piece. So, so four key things, because we're going to start framing some critical thinking prompts shortly. Four key questions that we want to deal with uh, or, or criteria that we want to think about when framing questions. When we frame our question, we always want to ask ourselves, does the question or task require that students make some kind of assessment or judgment considering a variety of options? And so the first thing, is there a judgment involved? Secondly, will the students see the challenge as meaningful? So will the students be engaged in the task as something they see relevant and meaningful? Of course, uh, we need to always be concerned that it, that it addresses the curricular understanding, that we're addressing the curriculum we're, we're charged to teach. And, and the, the last one, which is really a caution, be careful to focus the challenge that we create so that students can manage it. If we ask too broad a question, too big a question, it can overwhelm students. We want to keep it tight enough that they can assemble the required background knowledge and be able to make a thoughtful decision. Okay. Now, in the work that we've done in, in critical thinking, and, and many of you have, have seen me talk about the prompts before, uh, we've identified six ways of thinking critically. There are essentially six ways that we engage um, students in thinking critically. And here are the six prompts. I'm going to touch on them quickly. And then I just want you to, to uh, think for a moment. I put on the slide just the generative or reactive. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do a sort in a moment. But let me go through them with you. Critique the piece. If I asked you, have you seen a movie recently? Was it a good movie? I'm essentially asking you to critique the piece. In other words, I'm assuming you have some criteria in mind that what, what constitutes a good movie and you would give me your response uh, and, and be able to say that. So if I read a movie review, if I read a, a restaurant review, I'm reading a critique the piece. So when we ask children, uh, was this character a good friend to others? Or was this character a heroic character? And so on, we're asking them to critique. Um, just dropping down to the pink box. Judge the better or best is how we would broaden that a bit. If I said, you know, is the Eaton Center a good place to shop during the Christmas season? Critique the piece. Is it better to shop at the one of a kind show or the Eaton Center? Judge the better or best. Note to make my decision, I need some criteria. Where will I find the best selection, the best quality, the best prices? Um, those might be three criteria I could use. So we critique, we judge. When we ask kids to rework the piece, we ask them to change something. So if we change the audience, what would have to be different? Uh, if you rewrote the ending of a story from a, a different character's perspective, how would the story change? If I redrew a picture from a different perspective, how would the picture look differently? Um, if you were to redesign something for another purpose, change a variable in a science experiment, what would the likely outcome be? So when we rework, we ask students to, to reimagine something in a different way. And when we decode the puzzle, um, if you do a science experiment and students have to explain what happened, they're doing a decode the puzzle. Um, when, if you looked at a picture and you asked them to try to explain what's happening in the picture, uh, they'd be doing a decode the puzzle. Uh, reading a math graph, uh, figuring out the theme in a story, those are all decode the puzzle. Uh, when we design the specs, we're asking students to create something. So I want you to write a persuasive paragraph. I want you to create a, a convincing poster. I want you to build a model or something. These are all designed to specs, writing an essay and so on. We set out clear criteria for an effective essay, an effective poster, uh, an effective video. 
And when we ask students to perform the specs, we ask them to, to uh, do a, a presentation, to uh, play in sports and be able to monitor how they're doing in sports, to uh, perform in the arts. Those are performed specs where students have clear, um, clear understanding of, of what's expected and they're able to monitor their own progress. So those are the six. Now I put on the sides generative and reactive. And what I mean by that is that reactive thinking, um, reactive thinking is something has to exist. So the movie had to exist for you to critique it. So that would be a generally we would see it as a reactive. Um, but design specs, you're, you're doing the creation. So we'd say that's more generative. If I ask you to come up with a new idea, you're generating. Um, if I ask you to respond to something, you're reacting. Now, some might argue that in some ways critique, if I have a novel way of reacting and an insight that others didn't have, I might generate new ideas. What I want you to do is just take a moment and, and in the chat window, if you would please, could you just note, um, if you were to divide these between, and I'm going to ask you to, well actually I think we'll do something different here. I'm going to, I'm going to stop the sharing for a moment. Just, um, just give me one second. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do is um, I'm going to go to the whiteboard for just a second. There we go. And with a little help from Louise, we'll set this up. Louise, I want to use the whiteboard. There we go. And what we're going to do is we're going to put um, a heading, generative, Let's get this. And reactive. Now, what I'd like you to do is um, so there were the six prompts, and we'll just write them. If I can get Louise just to write them at the bottom, we'll tighten them up. We're just going to put on on here just so you can have them as a reference. So critique. Judge. Um, rework, decode, design, perform. What I'd like everyone to do, just using that as your guide, just so you remember where they are, if you could put the six prompts, would you put them, which ones would you put under generative? under reactive, or if you think they go somewhere in between, put them somewhere in between. And if you think it's more generative than reactive, you'll lean that way. If you think it's more um, reactive, you lean that way. And if you think it should be pretty close to center, put it there. Now, I think the easiest will be, uh, but Louise, can they copy these or should they just type in their own? I'm going to turn these over to Louise just to, to give you direction now. This, that'll be a good test. You know what? I'm just going to check and see. Uh, no, you do not want to be using the copy. So you can retype, folks, uh, just grabbing the text tool, which is, again is the capital letter A tool in the middle of the uh, whiteboard tool strip. And it does work better if you do uh, switch so it is just the capital A and not the A with the little text lines beside it. So if you've already grabbed some of our orange words and moved them around, uh, if you haven't put where you think you would like yours to be then, uh, you can just uh, retype those words under the column you think they uh, fit best. I'm wondering if people are perhaps still thinking or not sure what they're to do. Garfield, do you want to describe it again? Garfield, your mic's off. Garfield, are you still there? I'm wondering if perhaps he had to step away for a second in a hurry. Um, so I'll just follow up and re-describe. So 
uh, I love that you guys have uh, uh, created some different challenges to put under there. Um, but if you want to just use the six orange prompts of uh, critique, judge, decode, rework, design, and perform, and decide whether or not any of those six prompts sound like they are more of a reactive task or whether they're a generative task. And you can just retype the same word. You can retype decode or retype perform under the, uh, the heading that you think it's most appropriate. You guys are doing well. And if you finished placing your six prompts, then uh, I'm going to switch the polling option back to the uh, yes or no. And you can give me a, uh, a green check mark when you're done. I'm just going to check in again with Garfield. Garfield, can you hear us OK? I'm wondering if something's happened at your end. Oh, there you are. No, nope, I'm good. So we're ready to. So we've got an interesting split of things across here. Now only one sitting in the center, which is interesting. Renee, I'd like to ask you if you could throw in the chat window, filling in a worksheet. Could you tell me the nature of the worksheet that you have in mind? You see, I want to say generally uh, a worksheet with fill in the blank. Um, would not be seen as critical thinking. It's a recall task. That would be that's what we would call typically a type one task, which wouldn't fit into these six prompts because it's simply a recall task. Uh, if I'm understanding what, what you mean. So, so what we what we would do is say, well, what's the critical thinking we're asking students to do? So yes, Renee, just to, to clarify, all six of these prompts. These are all ways that we engage kids um, in cr thinking critically to get to that type three that we want to get them to. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on that. So all of these, the, and the reason for the six prompts, how can we get kids um, to think critically, six different ways that we can get them there. Now, I want to shift. I want to get us to the, the cascading piece. So I'm just going to go back to sharing my desktop. All right, there we go. I'm just going to jump by that because we need. I want to quickly show you a sample, and then we're going to shift. I want to show you this is a sample of uh, a National Geographic uh, flip chart for an interactive whiteboard. And I wanted to show you how they set it up and then how we tweaked it for inquiry. So here's, here's a sample. Uh, they have a menu, a vocabulary. So this is, you know, the students are learning about sea turtles. I'm going to do it fairly quickly. Uh, they have a reading strategy. Summarize what you learn from a reading and there's a reading provided. And they are summarized on the board. They use this magic revealer to look around and see if they can find the eggs. So the kids would come up to the board and, and they find it really cool when they discover the eggs using the magic revealer. There is a, a task here for them to match definitions. So they would uh, see if they can match the definition uh, and have an understanding of the different terms. So I'll just switch this back. Uh, what, do, and what do they eat? So they read this and they just basically pull that information from the sheet. Who are their predators? How do they protect themselves? They um, put some more information down. Uh, here you'll notice when I click on one, two, three, it gives the students different information. 
Okay. And they summarize that. There's a KWL chart in the middle. What, what do I know? What do we want? I want to know. When you click on the turtle, it moves along. So the students can click on the turtle and move the turtle towards the water. And then you'll notice at the end, there's a multiple choice quiz. Now, what I want to show you is, as much as I find that a visually stunning uh, bit of work, I think National Geographic's work is beautiful, there's good content in there and so on, uh, there's really no critical thinking uh, in that at all. It is, it is all, um, it is all content. So what I was just talking about when I said type one, two, or three, that that entire thing is some nice technology tools, but really no critical thinking. So just very quickly, I want to show you. Uh, here's here's a tweet. So if we want to build it around inquiry, which is what we want to talk about today, how do we build inquiry? Well, we put a critical challenge up front to drive it. We build the intellectual tools. And we go through the task. So notice now, up front, this is my invitation for inquiry to students. Instead of learn about the sea turtles and then give them a quiz, I ask them right up front, right off the bat, sea turtles need our help to survive. Your challenge is to develop a public service announcement to help raise awareness and let people know what they can do to help. Here are the intellectual tools we talked about briefly earlier. To do, to do this task, you have to understand their nestings, you have to understand about the hatchlings, what their food sources are, and who their predators are. The criteria, when you develop your plan, it has to be feasible, effective, and sustainable. Three criteria to guide you. So the language you need to understand, we're going to talk about significance, we're going to talk about predict, we're going to talk about an inference. Okay. Uh, we're going to use a ranking ladder and a KWL. And the habits of mind, you'll need to pay attention to detail persevere and remain open-minded. Those, those are the critical thinking tools. You'll notice what I've added. These pages are going to look very familiar, but I've just added little bits to keep driving the inquiry. Here are four terms. Do the matching. But in the end, which of these three terms are most important to know to help sea turtles? Your task, remember, is to create a public service announcement. And we tell the students, you're only allowed to keep three of these four terms which one would you let go of? If you, had to, if you could only use three of these, which are the most important to help you develop your public service announcement? We moved the KWL up a little earlier, and instead of, you know, what do I know, where students may say nothing, what do you want to know, nothing, uh, what have I learned, we put a little video, I'm just circling around the little video, it's a six minute video by National Geographic on sea turtles. From the video, tell me three things that you now know about sea turtles that will help you in developing your public service announcement. Tell me two or three things that raise questions that you need to know more about, and then when you found your research, what have you learned? So we use this to support them in their task. Note here we've added, and they said summarize what you read. Include only information that's important and relevant to the challenge. Your job, how do we help save the sea turtles? What's important and relevant? What's your criteria for that? Does it help me understand what turtles need to survive? Does it give me clues as to what threatens sea turtles? So I'm using criteria to help students in note taking. So you'll notice here, when you read, instead of just saying to kids, summarize important points, and they're not sure what's important and what's not important, we give them some criteria to, to test. So will that help you in this way or that? Again, with the, this task that students really like finding the eggs, we add a little challenge to it. Now, given where you found the eggs, which of these two do you think is the biggest threat? And students have to have a discussion and make a decision. And then when they move the turtle forward, instead of just moving it forward and they're done, given where the turtle has to get from when it's born into the water, what do you think is most dangerous and what can we do to increase survival? And so we use, you know, just here, how does the information help me understand the challenges? Uh, Rather than just read and discuss, we give them a critical thinking prompt. What are the three greatest challenges? Here are four challenges, what's the greatest? You'll notice at the end, I don't have, um, for me, there is no um, multiple choice quiz at the end. I don't need a multiple choice quiz because they've been working throughout um, 
how would I prepare a public service announcement? And each time we do a little task with them there, they take that information and they use it to, to think about how they'll, they'll, they'll build this. So let me just pause for a moment. Um, so I'm just reading Renee's comment. Um, the interactivity, this is a good point. See, what I did is I simply found existing material that I thought was very rich and said, now how will I take that and tweak it so it invites critical thinking. So I just, what I want, we're going to start playing with this now. I'm going to, I need to shift us so we get to the place we need to be. But I want to set up the inquiry. I want to show you a model where I want you to know I don't teach kids all about sea turtles. And now that you've learned all about sea turtles, come up with a plan to save them. That was flipped around, if you noticed. The very first slide after the, after the title page. Your job is to develop a plan to save the sea turtles. To do that, you have to know about sea turtles. You have to know what threatens them so you can develop your plan. But the challenge, the invitation to inquire, drives the learning. It's up front. In fact, I often tell people that lately I don't like the term culminating activity because too often, too often, culminating activity sits at the end. That, that we, give, we teach kids content, and when we've taught them enough content, we give them the task. What I want to strongly suggest you think about this evening is turning that upside down. And so that, that instead of thinking about culminating activities, we start thinking about driving activities. This activity is going to drive the learning. So over the next week, over the next several days, over the next three weeks, we're going to dig deeper and deeper into an issue. And as you learn more and more, you're going to be able to come up with the different answers. Now, I understand students' answers will change. They should revise. They should muck about. Now, let me just show you. This is what I mean by sustained inquiry. And I'm, I'm just going to give you a quick. Uh, I was at a, a, a presenting at a brain research conference in Beirut about a month and a month and a half ago, and one of the neuroscientists who presented, who delivered the first keynote. Uh, I was at the end of the day. She was the beginning of the day. She talked about how do we nurture, how do we teach to get sustained inquiry. And, and she made the point that sustained inquiry connects to the pleasure center of the brain. We continue doing something because we derive some kind of satisfaction from it. So, so why would we want to engage in learning? Uh, well, we do that because there's some sense of satisfaction. And that, uh, at, a, at a neuroscience level, at a, at a neurobiology level, is, is a product of dopamine. Dopamine is the source of intrinsic satisfaction. Uh, when we get a dopamine burst in the brain, we get a sense of satisfaction, feeling good. Um, by the way, if you Google uh, dopamine boosters, you will see things like caffeine, chocolate, and so on. The, the dopamine is released by certain chemicals. How do we get a dopamine boost in classrooms? Uh, note the two things on the screen here, success and challenge. If I give you, you know, the worksheet mentioned earlier, that's merely retrieving information that exists in the text, and it doesn't really challenge me. It, it's, it's, it takes time, but it's not challenging. I don't get a dopamine boost because I, I don't have this, I don't get a sense of satisfaction from that. On the other hand, if you give me a challenge that's too difficult that I, that I can't do uh, and I struggle with, again, I don't get a dopamine boost. So what we need is to find a challenge that's appropriate, you know, cognitively appropriate for students that we scaffold so that they're having every day, they're having another hit, another dopamine boost. You noted the last line here that the research shows that you need to be successful at least 20% of the time. Okay? So at least 20% of the time for, for an activity to act as a dopamine booster. So I wanted to show you what that might look like. And, and what I've been using lately as, as an example is Angry Birds, that, that Angry Birds really understands intrinsic motivation and, and have capitalized on this. Um, let me just pause for a moment. Uh, could I just see by uh, a vote here, just a checklist I think we'll use this time. How many of you are familiar with Angry Birds, either you know, from avid players to some familiarity? So if you know Angry Birds a little bit uh, to a lot, just, you know, I guess, we, okay. And if you've never heard of Angry Birds, So just let me, as the votes are coming up there, uh, just let me tell you, Angry Birds has played about now, um, the research I was reading, about 200 uh, million hours uh, are being played, 16 years the equivalent of per day, and you look at people playing it. So what is it, uh, Nancy, for others who are un unfamiliar, basically uh, you launch these birds from a slingshot trying to knock out the pigs um, that they have a vendetta against, and it's just a 
basically it's a physics game. You have to adjust your angles and, and so on to try to knock out these pigs. But what they get right is they start simple. You launch the bird. And by the way, you just launch. You see how the bird flies. Then you say, okay, that didn't work. I need to adjust. And you make it, you reset the game, and you go at it again. Most people who play, if you knock out all the pigs, but you don't get a high enough score, you can get one star, but not three stars. And then people go back, and they'll replay it until they get all three stars. Then it bumps you to the next level. And the next level, they've increased the complexity. And then eventually, they'll add a new bird that does something different. What they figured out, though, is sustained inquiries. This is uh, based on, let me just show you quickly. They've got sustained inquiry happening. And if we want to teach for deep understanding, then we need to think about how do we design our classrooms and our curriculum around sustained inquiry. Not once I've taught enough stuff, I'll give you a project, but the project actually drives the learning. It, it sits up front. And the second piece is what I would call um, design down teaching. And what I mean by this is uh, lots of people have been involved in design down planning and the Wiggins and McTie work for a very long time. But I find often students aren't aware of what's expected. So, Design down teaching is making clear to the kids where they're going, that you're going to be creating this, this uh, public service announcement, and here's how we're going to get there. And we want to build in what I call failing forward. This is what Angry Birds really understands, is that the greatest learning actually comes from failure. Some of the best learning in the world has happened when things didn't work, not because they did work. And I'm afraid that in education, we too often, we've made failure out to be a bad thing and kids fear it, when in fact, it should be something they embrace as where their best learning happens. So, so how do we get there? So this is what I call the cascading curriculum. You've got the blank template. I'll just show you. Uh, I've set this up, and I'm going to get you to comment in just a moment. I've set this up around, uh, if I had lots of time with you, how I might take you through a, a, a model. What I call the transcendent question. What is the issue idea concept that students will take away that connects to life beyond this particular class? In other words, I, I want to think about what is it you're learning in my classroom that is really important to life? And so and students want to know, but why do I need to know about New France? What is, what's the big lesson that we take from that? And often it's not about New France. It's often about other issues. So what is the issue or concept that, that is bigger than the curriculum? Like, like why do I need to know this science? How is this mm -hmm. going to help me? And I, I want the answer for students not to be, uh, because it's on the test or because it's in the curriculum. So, um, what, so an example, uh, you know, there's lots of neuroscience out there, some of it uh, not very reputable and so on. How can we best use neuroscience, uh, or how can neuroscience best be used to support learning? Critical thinking question. Uh, now, my next one, what's the critical challenge that will drive the learning for the unit? So why are we learning this stuff? Because I want to support learning. What will drive the learning for the unit, and what will be produced to demonstrate achievement? Now, I've put those two together, and if I asked you to design the ideal brain-compatible classroom, that's your challenge. Now, I want you to imagine, this is how I, how I might teach a course at, at the, in the faculty, that in September, I might say to my students, your job uh, is going to be to design the ideal brain-compatible classroom. And they're going to look at me and say, how can we do that? We don't know that much about teaching. We just started. I'm going to say, you're absolutely right. That's why you come to my class. So we're going to spend some time thinking about how physical space can be used most effectively. And we're going to have a series of lessons, or mini lessons, all of them being little critical challenges. Then we're going to spend time thinking about assessment. How do we use assessment to, to nurture intrinsic motivation? Then we're going to look at instruction. What instruction has the greatest value? And what series? So you'll note underneath each of the color-coordinated pieces are a series of, of lessons. So how can physical space, that might yield three or four lessons. So what you see there is perhaps a month worth of teaching. What are the best uses of technology to enhance? Now, that's a teacher frame. So here's what I wanted you to do. I, I wanted you, now actually, I think what we should do, just to help out here, um, before we go to this piece, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask again for um, Louise's help. Uh, Louise, could we bring up the samples I sent you earlier? Thank you. Here are some other samples that I've worked on with teachers, and I just thought I'd put a few in across some grades, so just so you can see how it might work out. The, the question that they're looking at, so in the uh, grade, what will become the new grade six curriculum, the current grade seven, 
they were dealing with early New France and the establishment of the colony. So we asked about the bigger question than the particular, how important are governments in creating successful communities? That question could apply to today. Uh, it could apply to um, 50 years ago. It could apply to 100 years ago. How important are governments in creating successful communities? Grounded in the curriculum, how successful was the local government in creating a successful and stable economy? And your challenge would be to take part in the trial of Jean Talon for incompetence. Okay? Now, what we're doing next is, well, how are we going to, how are we going to look at that? Well, there's four things you're going to have to think about. Did he create a sustainable colony? Did he, did, did he have the people that he needed? So in our lessons now, we're going to look at who did Jean Talon bring to colonize? Okay. Did he have the right balance? And so on. Okay. Uh, two, did he create a sustainable e economy? Uh, how, what economy did he try to build and so on? Did he create a defensible colony? Did he create the conditions for the church to grow and flourish? All of the things kids need to learn about New France are going to be addressed under those four. So we will address the entire curriculum. And the students have to, as they learn more and more about Jean Talon, they're going to think about, well, was he a good ruler or not? Uh, here's one for grade two. Uh, this is uh, build it, so this is one of movable parts. So the, the big question, how can our understanding of science help us to create simple machines that can make life easier and more enjoyable? The students are to build a toy with movable parts and prepare an ad to let people know. To do that, they first have to understand how things move. They also know have to understand the concept of machine. Remember, this is grade two. They have to think about how they would build a toy, and they have to think how they would advertise. Then we have a series of lessons. All of them, you'll notice, using the six prompts that we talked about, as students work through how they're going to build it. And, and lastly, here's a high school example where students were asked uh, in this task, explain why a curveball curves and why it's difficult to hit. But instead of teaching them the physics first, and at the end as a culmination asking for that question, we put the question up front. Now, this one's not finished and, and fleshing it all out, but when I say to the teacher, for a student to be able to explain why a curveball curves and it's difficult to hit, what would they have to know? And the teacher told me they have to understand acceleration due to gravity, Newton's third law, Newton's second law, and speed equals distance over time. And I then said, so tell me the lessons you teach, and you see those being scoped out. As students do each of those lessons, they develop a deeper and deeper understanding of the concept you see with the bolded outline. And as they develop the four bolded outlines, mm -hmm. their answer gets clearer and clearer. And they, by the way, they should refine, change, and polish their answer. Now, one last thing I want to mention before we, we go back to this. I think it's very important students maintain what I call a thought journal. And a thought journal is going to be uh, a, like an artist's sketchbook, uh, a little Hillroy book, where the very first day I ask them to think about, speculate, tell me what they think. Why do you think a curveball curves? Do you think, what do you know about governments? Do you think Jean Talon, based on a very cursory reading, seems like confident or not confident, whatever it might be? I want you to know, every time we teach a lesson and we dig deeper, students are invited back to a thought journal to change an answer, to expand on it, to add new evidence. So they muck about, this is what I meant earlier about allowing them to fail forward. Let me, let me take a stab at something, launch those birds, and then let me learn and revise and, ref and, and rethink and change my answer over time. And the thought journal is where we see all kinds of perseverance, attention, to detail, all those things coming in. Now, what I wanted to do is pause, because I'm doing way too much talking, and I was hoping that you would take a few minutes and just focus. I've just zoomed in here. I want you just to focus on what unit, and we'll just spend a couple of minutes on this, what issue, idea, concept, what unit might you work on, and how would we connect it? So if you could just start with, um, on your own, and then maybe throw in the chat window. Uh, tell me a unit. And if you're not sure what the transcendent question is, could you just throw in the window, I'm thinking of a unit on this in grade two. What might a transcendent question be? And let's see if we can help each other out. So who has one you could share? What I was hoping we could do with a bit of this time is just, uh, sorry, I'm just going to slide mine out of the way. Don't worry about seeing that. You've got it uh, on your handout. Let's start poking about with 
a sample. So what would be a question that you might want to work with or a topic? So Renee, you have to throw French grammar at me. Boy. <laughs> no problem. I'll give you some, some thoughts on that. Okay, so what do I really like seeing here? I want you to know what a few people are doing. And I'm going to back up in just a moment. Um, so Nancy, uh, when should countries intervene in another country's uh, internal conflicts? Yeah, that's a great transcendent question. I love that because we could be asking it in the context. I could take the newspaper in today and say, you know, at what point should we be stepping into Syria, into this country? To, you know, at what point? Where do you draw the line? Where do you step in? And then, as the trend, then we move it, and we're going to talk about this in a moment. Saying, okay, well, in World War One, or in this conflict, or in that, but we're we're getting kids to think about the issue in in a broader context. Um, so a couple of this. So do the ends justify the means? And again, so that might, uh, Scott, I'm not sure if this is what you have in mind, but I'm thinking, um, you know, can, we ju can the use of the atomic bomb um, be justified given that, you know, and so on. And, but you're asking the question nicely in a broader context where we could say in the future, in the past, that we ask this more transcendent question. Now, there's a couple of others. I'm, you know, again, I'm thinking about uh, when we look at at French grammar, um, you know, I, I think I, I guess an interesting transcendent question is for students just to think about, um, you know, should we be concerned uh, about grammar? You know, is 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 pr the use of proper grammar um, overhyped or, or something like that? And then have students explore in a task what happens when you know, and and they they start to explore. Uh, is, is meaning lost? Is, is there any danger in that? And they have to make a decision. So they might start by saying, no, I think people make too much of it and so on. By the end, will they change their mind as they explore this? Um, relationships between First Nations and early settlers. I mean, a nice one for a transcendent question for us to start thinking about um, just you know, how people treat each other, um, you know, when people come into contact. Can both sides be winners? Do, you know, do there have to be, can, can mutually beneficial um, arrangements happen? At what point do relationships become one-sided or so on? So we start looking at using that as an encounters kind of piece. Um, so I'm just in nice, great. Now, I want to just keep an eye on our time. So what I want to do, so Remember, the transcendent question for me is not the curriculum, and I want to be careful in saying this. This is where I'm simply trying to step back from the curriculum and ask myself, when students want to know why do I need to know this, what answer will I give them? But this is really, when we build on that, what is the critical challenge? So what many of you did, and it's the way we would proceed with this, is that we've grounded that transcendent question in the curriculum, but now we need to think, I need to move into the, that's why I call it a curriculum challenge. What critical challenge, what will the critical challenge be that will drive the learning? The bigger questions we are asking are too big. We need to now bring those down to the unit. So, so when Scott asked, you know, does the ends justify the means? Um, well, in, in this case, we want to ask it in the particular context of, you know, the use of the atomic bomb or, um, you know, when we look at the interactions between communities, in this case in particular. And the second piece we have to think about, not only do we frame the question, the critical thinking question that drives it, but what will students produce to demonstrate the learning? This is where we create opportunities for authentic learning. So, you know, for example, if we were to put Truman on trial, uh, put Harry Truman on trial for crimes against humanity, in which one side will argue that, the, that he, he's not guilty because the ends justify the means and the others would argue against that. So, Participation in the trial would be the demonstration of their learning 
the challenge we to determine whether or not the use of the atomic bomb was legitimate uh, given the circumstances. Let's take a moment and share some thoughts because you've already started us off on this. Could you uh, share some ideas as to what would your critical challenge for your particular unit be and what might we get kids to do? Again, feel free to throw in the window, I'm not sure, I want to study, I want to have kids look at this topic and I'm looking for suggestions and I'll try to quickly feed back what might be a way to frame it as a critical thinking question and what might be a critical thinking task that kids would do. So I'm going to pause and ask you if you could uh, throw in the window uh, specific topics that would drive a unit or a block of, of study, um, okay, and as well as a possible project if you have any in mind, or as I say, ask me for, uh, give me the prompt and I'll see if I can help out. Okay, so I'm going to try to respond as these start to come in. So Brenda, I'm going to suggest to you uh, that we be careful. How does, uh, we'll be possibly seeing my students with a list question and, and so they'll try to figure out, you know, five ways that it strengthens or maybe they can find in their textbook. So we want to be careful. In fact, if we just drop the how, um, and I, it, it starts to open up for me, you'll notice, you know, does trade between Canada's provinces and territories strengthen the country as a whole? So that might be the question, I'm, and I might want them to have to decide, um, you know, should, um, should, Canada, should, should Ontario, for example, be seeking outside trade opportunities or internal trade, uh, you know, which should we work harder to strengthen right now? Um, and so it would open up a debate about, you know, whether or not, um, you know, should Canada be seeking greater trade links with, with China or greater trade links uh, internally. So now we've got a judgment and that would open up opportunity for debate. Now Brenda, I'm not sure what grade level. We want to think too, what will be helpful is we start thinking about what would kids produce to answer this question? Grade four, great. So uh, yeah, that, that <laughs> my response was, was definitely, um, no mine was more of a high school response. So I, I think what we might do with grade fours, and just to give you an example, um, is Um, if we were to ask students, um, you know, if you were a representative for a province, um, which of your products would be best traded with another province and how would that help? I think this, the country as a whole is a big one. So they might want to look at, um, you know, perhaps they're, re they're representing or they're creating a proposal uh, as a representative for one of the provinces and they have to decide which of their products they, you know, should market the most uh, to other provinces and which province would they want to trade most with or something like that. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, great, that works well. Um, Nancy, evaluate Mackenzie King's approach. Okay. Um, so another nice opportunity. So what we want to do is, uh, help students see the decision we want them to make. I mean, to evaluate is, is a judgment. I would think for grade 10, which I'm assuming you're doing that in, um, I might, I might want to get them to assess, um, you know, should Mackenzie King be seen as a champion of democracy um, or, um, or failing to do too little for democracy or something like that. that that almost putting them on trial for um, failure to defend democracy and, and, and then you cite different examples. Notice if I put them on trial, uh, it immediately gets the class time to dig in to, um, to make the judgment and they can both defend and, and so on. So you could, uh, I could see that being either a trial, a mini documentary, uh, a globster in which they assemble evidence in a digital poster. Um, but I think making the case whether we should, uh, should, should Mackenzie King be, uh, de, you know, uh, heralded or derided as the defender of democracy might be a nice one to work with. Very 
Henriette, that's a wonderful, the new treaty uh, creations. I love it. And I love the way you've woven in um, at least two criteria there, that the treaty has to be fair and equitable. Uh, in fact, the third criteria could, you know, is widely applicable, so it could be used as a global template, and um, and then share their treaty components. That that's wonderful. Uh, Scott, the, the, I, I think again, um, first of all, I, I think that uh, I may even frame my whole World War II unit around ends versus means and then have the RCF, which I'll come back to in one second, that is a particular. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is to ask, uh, uh, did the Allied forces fight an ethical war, for example, as, as my big question. And by the end of the war, the students have to decide, uh, did we fight an ethical war or, or did we have to resort to unethical means? And then the RCF becomes one of the examples in building. And, and, and so they would have this debate running throughout, which might be a nice way to frame that. Um, and I might use a U-shaped discussion here where students take a position on a continuum from um, you know, absolutely valid uh, you know, somewhat, but I would have cut back a bit to bombing civilians is never allowed. Um, and, and the students are invited to shift positions as they hear uh, new evidence and, and have to consider new options. Um, I could send you details on a U-shaped discussion. It's, it's tough with this much time left. Boy, I like that, Nancy. Design an international moderation community that would help defuse conflict. Now. Uh, let, let's, because these are some really rich ones, let me just move to the next piece. Remember, once we framed our, our question, so we want to think about this big issue. So let me just take the one I threw out to Scott just for a moment. But, you know, did the Allied forces wage an ethical war in World War II? Let's say that's, so my transcendent question might be around, you know, um, you know can ethics and warfare coexist or, you know, whatever, something like that. Um, and my critical challenge is to determine if, uh, if the Allied forces waged an ethical war. My follow-up challenge to that might be, I sorry, not my follow-up, but the task then could be something from produce a small, um, a short documentary, it could be produce a digital poster, you know, it could be write an essay. I mean, you could give them a variety of or put the Allied commanders on trial again. So there are all kinds of options we can use. But the next key is what, what are our lines of inquiry? So as we build this out, if I want to know, for example, uh, did the Allied powers wage an ethical war, I'd have to, there are, what lines of inquiry would I have to explore? Right? I'd have to understand the context for the war. I'd have to understand uh, the challenges they were facing. I'd have to understand the ethics of warfare. So perhaps one line of inquiry might be what does ethical warfare look like? How did new weapons challenge our beliefs about that? So it might be all around the new weapons of war and what were long-standing you know, assumptions about war. I might look at the events of war because that, you know, as I start looking at the battles, I start looking at the Nazi tactics. And this is what people have to respond to. I might look at the Allied strategies in response to the Nazis and how that played out. So what I start doing in my lines of inquiry is I start identifying, well, what, what are the big, four big ideas students need to understand? So, um, you know, when we looked at, at the provinces, I think, Brenda, you had the provinces. If I want to know about the trade, I might need to know about different regions of Canada and, the, and what we produce in each of the regions. I might think about what, uh, what trade and how we facilitate trade and what does that look like. So what we want to do in this section is start thinking about what are the four big topics. If I want students to answer this, this question, what are three or four big ideas students need to answer? Uh, Renee had asked about grammar. So perhaps I want students to, to explore how important is grammar. So their task is to write um, an authentic piece of writing um, in, in French. And you give them that task up front. And then each line of inquiry is about a particular piece of grammar. And they take the piece of writing they did first, 
So instead of the writing being the last, now that you've learned all the grammar, you make the writing first, and then as you teach the grammar, they go back and they revise and edit, and they see if the clarity of their message improves over time. So here we want to start building out one of the four, and each of these, by the way, notice uh, as I go to my next piece, each of these will then have a series of lessons. These are my daily lessons now. So what I'm trying to build here is, what's the big question driving my unit? And the project sits up front, and every day the students are invited to think about it and take what they learned from today's class and, and connect it to what would be in the yellow box. They would understand that for the next week, let's say, in the next three or four days, we're going to focus on the green. And we're going to, by the end, have this understanding. And that's going to be a building block to help you do what's in the yellow. Then we're going to explore this next issue. And we're going to dig into it for three or four days or a week. And that's going to help you. And each of these will become building blocks to help you get to the end. Now, let me just slide that aside. And, and my apologies as a quick uh, summary. Let me just see if there are some thoughts or comments. Um, let me just pause. I see a question here from, from Nancy. Uh, Louise, I can, do you have the U-shaped discussion, Louise, by any chance? I don't think I do, but I'll take a quick peek right now. Uh, we can, I can send the U-shaped discussion to Louise who could forward it to all of you by email. Uh, and essentially what we do in the U-shape is they say instead of it being a debate where students try to win over the other side, uh, they take a position along the continuum um, and as they argue and they listen to each other, uh, you invite them to, to rethink their position and consider shifting it. And there's a couple of different rubrics in there to help. Um, but but I you know the, let, let, we only have a few minutes left. So I just wanted to get your response, uh, thoughts to the cascade. Uh, I'm hoping that what you're seeing is that it's really a tweak to what you already do. That it's really just getting us to think to move from the bottom to the top. What is it I want kids to learn? What's the what's the thinking question I want to drive their learning? And how will they demonstrate that learning? Now, what do I have to build? By the way, the template, once I've developed it, like you see here, I would post this on my wall, on my class website, because at a glance, you have a roadmap. Parents will understand. This is what kids are working towards. Here's how we're getting there. Here's how each of my lessons supports it. It's just a very, very clear way to scope out a unit, and then from there, develop each of the lessons. So, uh, let me just uh, finish because we just have a few minutes left. Um, thoughts. Um, it seemed a bit rushed to me tonight. My apologies for that. Um, but it's a start. And I'm wondering if you think that there's some merit. Does it fit what you're doing? So let me just say in, in, in response, Marriott, to, to your comment. The thought journal, I think, is a really important piece. And, and as I've seen it used, I'm starting to develop this idea that students have a place um, to uh, muck about. And it should be messy. I, I tell them it should be like Leonardo da Vinci's journal. You should draw pictures, arrows, cross things out, make notes in the margins. It's where kids can be messy and just do their thinking and change their mind and gather new stuff. And I would call, personally, I would not mark a thought journal. Um, Instead, I would collect it to triangulate my evidence. In, in addition to the product that was created and all the rich conversation I hear in my class, the thought journal gives me evidence of students thinking and open-mindedness and willing to change over time. I wouldn't mark it because it will undermine, I believe, um, what we really want to do. Um, yeah, exactly. So you know, the thought journal, married to the cascading curriculum, launch your challenge right off the bat. Okay? Launch the challenge right off the bat. Let kids muck about. Let them make changes. Um, great. Well, I'm actually just beginning to write some stuff up on this, Renee, on, on, on the Cascade to get a little more published material on this. So hopefully we'll have something out soon. 
I think we're at an end. I felt very rushed. Uh, there's more than I thought about this, but I hope it was a good start. And as I said, I, I think it reinforces the good work the teachers are already doing out there. It just helps us put up front instead of at the end. So my, you know, my, my key message in the end, um, uh, Nancy, when you ask about literature, can I ask, do you mean to study literature or uh, I assume as opposed to writing it, right? I'm assuming um, to look at the literature. And um, yeah, what, what I would uh, be doing is taking a look at the, the questions often, the, you know, what, what's the theme underlying the novel? So, so you know, you, you, you pull out a big theme um, and, and you ask students, you know, you know, a big question that might be challenged uh, by the novel. And as they explore the novel, does it challenge their beliefs, their values, what they thought they believed? Um, use the, the novel um, as, as a springboard to inquire into um, the dominant themes and everything. Um, so I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up, but I'm glad I'm seeing some positive comments despite it feeling a little rushed. Um, as I say, take the critical thinking work, the good work that you're doing, launch those birds up front and then just build the scaff scaffolds, let kids muck about. Uh, let kids inquire every day so that thinking uh, is not what they do at the end of learning content, it's actually what drives the learning of content. So thanks everyone, have a, a great holiday break and, and let's hope that there's soon some positive resolutions to, to the labor strife in this province. But uh, I'm, I'm very glad you're able to join us tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Garfield. Uh, I think it's always better to leave them wanting more. <laughs> and so I've just posted the link to our resources page where you'll find some of the other sessions that Garfield has done previously that will be recorded and on there, as well as uh, uh, there's a few as well from his colleague Usha James that are also uh, critical thinking with the PC squared sessions. Um, hopefully we'll have some more after the, the winter holidays and uh, in the meantime if you guys would be able to, uh, you can either click directly on the screen, that tiny URL in blue and that is our feedback form and in only about one to two minutes if you could fill that out for us. I'll also follow up tomorrow with the, hopefully tomorrow if not Friday, with an email that also gives you the feedback link as well as the link to the new resource page that will be posted for this session that will include the recording. Um, so uh, please do uh, let your colleagues know about OTF Connects Hello. and um, thank you so much okay, for your so time tonight. To me. And um, yeah. we do hope to, uh, to see you again and Renee I do see your question about the slides being available. Um, are you asking specifically about uh, Garfield's other slides that were templates that were already somewhat filled in for the various subjects. All right, that would be up to up to Garfield. Garfield, you can let me know um, which, if anything, is something that can be emailed out, or whether or not it's something that can be posted to our website. Uh, otherwise, guys, the recording, you can always go back to the recording and move along to the slides that you do want to see. Uh, there is a, uh, when you review the recording, there is a, a slider there just like a YouTube video where you can just slide it along and uh, move to the portion of the recording that you might like to review. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to ask me. And uh, um, I see that Garfield's had to, to leave already, so thank you again, and uh, we hope to see you again soon.